Excellent. So welcome everybody uh, to uh, virtual global spine meeting tonight. We have a, uh, I'll repeat myself a little bit, we have a special treat tonight. Uh, Dr. Michael Kelly is here uh, to talk to us. Uh, I will be brief so he can get started, but uh, he was uh, at uh, Washington University uh, before he went out to California. And uh, when I started here uh, about three years ago, he was, you know, really the main person I relied on, not only to learn a lot about uh, deformity and help me apply it to my tumor patients, but also just, you know, having a, an older colleague who can help you when, you, when you're in trouble or you, you think you have something wrong or right about a case and you want to run, run it by somebody who's, who's willing to think about it with you uh, or help you if you're in trouble in the OR. So uh, I have learned a tremendous amount uh, from him, and uh, I think he has uh, such phenomenal insight about spine and deformity, and I'm always trying to kind of pick his brain for more. So uh, Mike, I'm not going to take any more of your time. I'm going to let you uh, take over and uh, take us through a few cases and, and, and give us the good word, man. All right, great. And everyone, uh, please feel free to um, interrupt as we go. I have a case to show uh, and then um, interrupt. And then I can give you the background and show you some of the sort of the science behind um, how I came up with these ideas and my thinking. Uh, so this patient is a 63-year-old woman uh, who, and this is like the tragedy of spine surgery, right? She had a four or five fusion for back pain. Then she got um, adjacent segment disease or malalignment disease <laughs> uh, and had an L3 to L5. Then she got subjacent segment disease and had an ALIF, only an ALIF. Um, not a front back. So I had an A lift that not unexpectedly, I think uh, fractured, and I didn't do this guys, uh, um, that I think either the graft dissolved or she got a S1 fracture a bit and the graft subsided and it failed. And the surgeon went in and just took it out and told her it was infected. Um, though my, my digging said there was no, um, uh, no infection. It was a non-union with a sacral fracture. She developed bilateral foot drops. She had DVTs, and now she comes to me with bilateral foot drops, an inability to stand upright, bilateral, um, probably either L5 or S1 radiculopathies. And I let me get this thing out of the way here. This is how she stands. Right now, she's standing with. Amp uh, what seems like a lot of lumbar lordosis, right? And I will tell you, like, what we're going to see that someone, and if you're on this call, I apologize, submitted a um, abstract to the SRS this year about how the high PI patient, the unsolved conundrum or something like that, where they, they had high PIs, really high PIs, and they, and they called that over 65, and they adjusted for age. And even when they gave them age-adjusted alignment, they failed. You guys will hear me sort of beat age-adjusted alignment to death uh, shortly, but these are very challenging. So now this patient's PI is over 100 degrees, in part probably because of the um, sacral end plate uh, erosion. Has a very high PT, though, for someone with a high um, pelvic incidence, perhaps a PT of 40 is actually not that far off, and an LL of 60 degrees. She stands with pelvic retroversion, uh, hip and knee flexion, and maybe a little bit of actually thoracic flattening, hard to tell, um, but she is forward. Here's a more zoomed in, and you can see actually, right, three fours pretty flat, four fives reasonably flat. No idea what's going on here at five one. Two three is quite hyperextended, and one two is quite hyperextended. So um, this also illustrates the reason why I sort of advocate against doing ACRs for flat backs is that you get this kind of upside down spine, right? The lordosis is down here and then it flattens out, but you have a lot of lordosis. The problem is we want this to be down here. We want all the lordosis down here and less up top in most cases, not in the PI of 110. So there's her lying down in the CT scanner, right? Here are all the measures. Get a PI, let's just call it, my brain works better with zeros and fives. PI of 100 degrees, a PT of 45 degrees, an LL of 60 degrees, and an L4 to S1 of 15 degrees. So, um, and like Matt, do you want 
you want me to ask people to give me assessments? Or you want me to just keep motoring? Uh, we can, we can, uh, we have a couple of panel men members who might look at that and have, I don't know if, uh, who's on now. Uh, certainly, uh, I should have introduced uh, Camilo at the start since he's uh, also a guest tonight. So Camilo Molina is also here, uh, one of my colleagues here. Uh, and, uh, I, uh, you know, we were at a conference earlier this year and he gave one of the best explanations of some of this stuff. So I don't know if, uh, if Camilo wanted to weigh in on any of this or if uh, Alex, uh, one of our uh, uh, panel members who's also here wants to weigh in on any of this, but happy to have them talk well, about I, it. I, I would say, Matt, that everything I, I gave in that talk, I learned from Mike Kelly here. <laughs> Kelly. I don't know if there's much I could add, but you know, I will say that I've never seen a patient have a PI greater than like 90, and that's like in a patient with a high grade spondylolisthesis. So, you know, I don't, you don't have the PI measurement on there, but that's, you know, incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Very unusual. Right. And then the, the, I, the Europeans have been very good about promoting the idea of the shape, right? And the lumbar distribution index and this patient's got 60 degrees of lordosis and only 15 degrees from L4 to the sacrum. So that's an atrocious lumbar distribution index. Um, Alex, LP, what you, what, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. The LPA, right? Which is what the number we're gonna talk about later on, which is the pelvic angle between the centroid of L1, centroid of S1 measures almost 50. Um, TPA is also 50. I think again, um, Femi's paper for TPA while showing that TPA, the T1PA is an excellent sort of overall measure of sagittal plane alignment. The, where they set the targets was irrespective of pelvic incidence, which is generally not correct. Pelvic angles incorporate um, pelvic tilt, and pelvic tilt is related to pelvic incidence. The tilts, like the L1 tilt, the C2 tilt, those are different, and those are perhaps better targets for normal standing. And having targets that do not accommodate the pelvic incidence for pelvic angles is, I would say, not correct. And the uh, uh, T1 tilt is plus five, which is a, a little bit high. Here's a uh, the CT scan, let's see, this is in part why, I mean, I bet the, the PI was probably closer to 90 and now it's all eroded and they just took the graft out. That's what we're dealing with. And then here's the thing in the Mike, front. Mike, yep. when you measure this PI, you know, I think this is not exactly the same case, but analogous to the patients who've had sacrectomies and then there's all these papers now. How do you, how do you remeasure their PI knowing that they have no sacral it's, For me, not like, it's kind of like doing a high grade spondy, right? Where the sacrum is remodeled. I try to look at where the caudal end plate of S1 is and then just try to imagine where the cranial end plate of S1 would be. I don't, sure. I, don't I, I can't see if that's doing anything. And then just call oh, that the midpoint yeah. there. You know what I mean? Yeah. It at least puts you in the right ballpark and it's better than doing nothing at all. Um, and at least you're consistent. But I think for our purposes, I think just knowing that the sacrum used to be here and this is what um, collapsed and subsided and fractured that, you know, this used to be up here. Um, so we know it's a super high PI. I'm just going to advance. Right, and three fours fused, four five is fused, three fours fused with an inner body, four five fuses without an inner body, and five one is obviously not fused. So she's got a fixed sagittal plane malalignment, an L5 S1 non union, an S1 fracture, a prior DVT, two prior anteriors now to that five one thing that has been rattling around and super inflamed, uh, and L5 S1, if you can look here is below the pubic symphysis. So I don't know if like, even if it was not below the pubic symphysis, I would not be advocating for a third anterior. And um, having been raised by Larry Lenke, um, that all posterior is possible. And then uh, I had my stepdad, Manish Gupta, showed me the light that um, the, the front of the spine is good when you can get there. And it's good when it's safe but it's nice to have all posterior understanding how much change you actually need to get uh, in your bag of tricks. So I don't think doing an anterior here is really feasible uh, nor intelligent. I think even suppose it had just been one approach, but now she's got like, maybe it's a Charcot or something like that. 
um, it's everything is going to be so adherent there. You're not going to be able to move the common iliacs at one bit, and uh, the veins will tear, and you can get into really, really bad situation. So I, I guess other question. Now we're just we're going to do it all posterior. And what are people's thoughts? Um, I think you need to think in terms of. How much lordosis? Where's the lordosis? And what are your upper instrumented and lower instrumented levels? Any thoughts from? Yeah, anyone? I wonder if Mike, it looks like Mike Selby's on here. I wonder if he's willing to, to tell us what his thoughts are on this. He's done a lot of uh, obviously disaster, crazy deformity. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Hey, Mike, uh, you guys got me. I'm just sitting in my car in Australia here and uh, doing my morning rounds, but. Uh, um, you guys, um, yeah, this is, a, this is a great point, Mike, on this case. And I do a lot of anterior surgery. I do a lot of crazy anterior surgery. And I have to say that even I probably would not take this on anteriorly because there are, there are too many strikes against this patient. The depth of that pelvis alone means it's going to be almost impossible to do a proper recon what this patient needs with the angles required, even if you could get there and even if you could move the vascul uh, vasculature out of the way. So, look, I'm... Uh, Yeah, I, I think if you could um, do this posteriorly, uh, all posterior, uh, or at least maybe with some lateral interbodies, some prone interbodies above the fusion, but really the deformity here is at the sacrum. So I think you need a sacral dome osteotomy here. And uh, and I'd probably navigate it because I can and, and cheat that way, really plan it out on your surgery map or whatever you use. And then you got to use quad pelvic fixation, um, you know, S2AI, iliac bolts, four rod fixation, uh, and I think just for control here, because it's so bad, the balance you want to get up to about, I usually go to T9 with sublaminar bands, but you can go to T10 with screws if that's what you usually do. So, yeah, you know, sacral dome osteotomy to me, correcting this deformity where it really is, uh, is the key here, I reckon. Yep. Yeah, I would. Uh, and that's the nice thing. I agree with most of that. One of the um, tenets that I have taken from talking to uh, Pierre Rousseli and Daniel Chopin and uh, sort of the older French guys who've been around the block is that in general for high pelvic incidents, I, I don't stop in the lower thoracic spine. Uh, I know everyone says, oh, we'll give them a shot, but because they will develop some sort of compensatory or like reactive kyphosis as that um, settles out, that compensation settles out, you don't ever know where that's gonna stop. And the PJK rate, um, seems to be too high for me. And uh, even when I debate people, um, they, <laughs> they put up patients that are PJKing and maybe they don't realize it. Um, Mike, so to that it, point, before you, before you move off that point, what, is, what, what do you think that rate is roughly? This came up the other day here and it was the same story. It was a high PI patient and it, it was the debate of, can they handle a bigger surgery or, or would they be fine? with not going up all the way to T3, T4. Uh, and that was, I don't know that I know the answer. I have a good feel for, for that. You know, the whole I don't know. That is one like that is one that you guys should look up in ASLS because it's a pretty clean database. Um, I can try an ISSG and take a look at it. There's just, it, that becomes such a hodgepodge at some point. I would say like for you, like look at what Manish Gupta does. Everyone in Manish's practice gets a T4 to the sacrum because he's got so much experience. And if you ask him about it, he's like, oh yeah. He's like, I'm just sick of not knowing if they're gonna be the one that PJKs or not. Uh, and he'll take people up just every, like T4 to the sacrum, T4 to the sacrum. And he reconstructs the lordosis. He avoids making the false type two profile. He reconstructs the lordosis, gives people a lot of lordosis. Steve Lewis had a paper once that talked about when you, if your UIV screws are like this pointing up, which is a large sweeping lordosis, right? That you're kind of in for it if you're in the lower thoracic spine. Yeah. Um, so for me, essentially like PI of 60, that was the one where I sort of debated and really was like trying to help people and, and let them be able to wipe their bottom and stuff like that. But over 65 or higher, I, I just go all the way up and dial it in. And, and as you'll see in a second, like we have an idea for where to put T4 in relation to everything to give them a perfect sagittal plane, which I think maximizes your chance of a good outcome. Now, Mike, you know, you're the one who kind of got me into thinking about the Russoli curves and when they're type three or type four, so take them up to the upper thoracic spine from the get-go. And 
And then I've nerded out quite a bit on this and gone and read Rusli's papers and Rusli's books. And he's a little bit more nuanced. It, it, he actually says that it depends where in the stage of degeneration that curve is. He says if it's a type three or type four curve, high PI, and they still have thoracic ky kyphosis, not hyperkyphosis, just their right, what you would expect their kyphosis to be, something yes. that closely matches their PI. Yep. Those people, if you can stop at a neutral, low thoracic vertebrae, he says you can. If they're hypokyphotic, meaning they're compensating with by hyperextending their thoracic spine, he says cover the thoracic spine because you, like you said, you don't know where they're going to. You don't know where they're going to relax to. So if they're, if most they're hypokyphotic to their PI he says cover it, and if they're, yep. they're or hypokyphotic, and if they're hyperkyphotic, well, you obviously have to cover it anyway. Right. Uh, yeah. So, Hyperkyphosis, right, as a result yeah. of disc degeneration and paraspinal weakness. Right. And the, um, you know, the one of the things like that, that compensation. So I love the patient with low PI with a straight thoracic spine because I can make their lordosis right. And they're only going to settle out to this and probably not PJK. And those are the ones that I thought were prime for like T10, T11 to the sacrums. Um, it's just so hard to know, like, is this correct for their thoracic spine for this patient? I, you know, probably yes, right? Probably yes, that you could stop somewhere up here. Um, but as you'll see, and we talked about yesterday, this one's, uh, I have a little bit different approach for those also when you don't think that the thoracic spine is degenerated or maximally compensated. But, but then I guess that's maybe where I disagree. I don't, if the patient really had a PI of 90, and I bet if you measure like kyphosis, I don't think it's, it might be like 45 or 50 degrees. So that might be a hypokyphotic spine for that patient. Yeah. I mean, that's why it's, it's hard. Like that's, and that goes back to the Gupta thing of like, you just don't really know. And it's so hard um, to forecast what appropriate TK should be. That's like the world I live in now. Like for any of you that do kids, right? What is your goal? Thoracic kyphosis. We don't have one. We all say like, oh, just maximize it. Maximizing it is probably just as wrong as making a lumbar spine flat. Uh, we need to figure out what right is. That's just a little bit harder with a, something like this, I think. Uh, so with, um, right, the plan. So a target LL for me, you know, I agree that she's got, um, especially standing, has some lumbosacral kyphosis. So we want to fix that. And then there's no lordosis from L4 to S1. So I want to fix that. The UIV, um, from my perspective, is either going to be either L2 or upper thoracic spine. And uh, Camilo and I have talked about this a couple of times that stopping your instrumentation within the upper arc of the lordosis, provided they have a reasonably normal thoracic spine, is, in my opinion, probably okay. Uh, and if I'm not going to stop in that upper arc of the lordosis, I'm not going to stop in the lower arc of thoracic kyphosis. And that's when I will cover it so that I don't have to deal with it. So um, the plan was actually L2 UIV. Target LL is in general 60% of 60% um, uh, of PI plus 30. So we need like 90 and about five degrees around there. So 85 to 95 degrees of lordosis to get this where we want it. Uh, and then positioning in the table, like if you need a lot of lordosis, you gotta make sure those pads are, are low, um, low and high, right? You don't really want the, that lower thoracic chest pad that'll block you from falling into lordosis a little bit. And I actually, I love the pro axis table for this. Uh, I was taught to do PSOs by Dr. Lenke on a six posted frame. The problem with a posted frame is, and Keith Bridwell, we would show these x-rays and oh yeah, look at how much lordosis. And he would always, good windows, he would do this with his fingers. And he would say, oh, you, you just seem to be, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, and what he meant was you're becoming kyphotic elsewhere for the sake of that lordosis. And if you imagine my fingers as their spine, and my fingertips of the PSO, on a posted frame, when the chest and the pelvis are fixed in space, this is what happens, right? My fingers become kyphotic as opposed to using the pro axis table where the chest is on a trolley. And with the chest on a trolley, you actually shorten the dorsal column and you can actually lengthen the anterior column as the spine goes like this. So I am actually a huge, and you don't have to compress anything. You don't stress your screws. Um, I am a huge fan of the pro axis table for three column osteotomies. 
So the plan is an L2 to S1 in the ileum with an L4 pedicle subtraction osteotomies, inner bodies at L4, L5, L5, S1 in part to do a La Martina corner osteotomy, which uh, you know the idea of people saying an extended PSO is where you take the disc two. The problem is if you take the disc two, it collapses. You need an interbody up front, all the way up front, because what we do not want to do is lose one bit of anterior column length. If you take if you if you take the disc and don't put an inner body in and it collapses, or you take too much of the vertebral body and it gets soft and it collapses a little bit, you're robbing yourself of, of angular change because the arc of the anterior column is going to be shorter, right? And the arc is equal to the radius times alpha. The radius is fixed. We're trying to maximize alpha. That means we got to maximize the arc. So here it is. This is the Mongo T lift cage into that big space where we took off some of the back of the sacrum. Uh, like Mike said, and screws up to L2. And we're gonna take out L4. Thankfully, it also has this interbody up here for a nice robust thing. This is a degenerated disc. So we want, so, like if it's solid through the front and you get their alignment right, I think you can reduce the number of rods you need to put in and things like that. I, I am not a huge fan of more than two rods in some cases. For most three column osteotomies, I like it. I like to do the satellite thing where you get the short construct and long construct. But for something like this, you start running out of, out of real estate. So here it is, huge cage in here, big lordotic cage in here, L4, PSO. L3 and L5 tulip heads actually blocked any further correction. They were kissing. Uh, and we went with five iliac screws per side. So now she's got an LL of 80. Her L4 S1 lordosis is now 50. Her LPA is down to 30. Uh, T4PA is down to 35. Thoracic kyphosis is up a bit, right? It was 35 before, now it's 45 and it, it sags a little bit. And the T1 tilt is back to a more normal spot with her standing upright. This is her discharge film. And these are her six month films. Uh, and we, I don't think, oh, there's an AP. You can see on the AP, we actually just two rods per side, two rods per side, inner body, inner body, inner body, less wiggle, I think, particularly when they're well fixed. It's not going to wiggle as much because there's not that pelvic retroversion that it's trying to flex through. Once if a PS undercorrected PSO, right, they're going to retrovert their pelvis. And once they retrovert, they're actually trying to flex through it. And for the orthopedic surgeons, you guys all know, like, that's not how you make bones heal. Uh, you got to have a solid construct. Uh, we're not doing wave plates down here, bridge plates or whatever it's called in the forearm. And you can see now the big difference in her standing alignment. T1 is way back. L1 is back a bit, but the LPA has changed because we have changed both the magnitude and the distribution of the lordosis. Uh, so comments or questions before I go into Kelly diatribe? I think you're going to get into the L1 pelvic angle here because this is an interesting case because it, I always think of L1 pelvic angle in general as being pretty low, uh, but here it's probably appropriate and, and you're going to probably teach us a lot about. Uh, yeah, that. and even like this, this is a really nice case um, oops, to think about the fact that choosing L1 as the top of your lordosis is, is random, right? It's just, we only chose it because it doesn't have a rib on it. That's why it's L1. And this patient's inflection point is much higher than L1, right? This has settled out a little bit. It's not hyperextended, but this is a smidge lordotic, and this is probably a smidge lordotic. And it's really not till we're at T10, T11 that things are starting to turn around. And that fits Rousselli's concept of these arcs of lordosis and um, distribution of lordosis. And the fact that as you get bigger, lord, in, essentially everyone has the same L4 to S1 lordosis, basically. And it goes up as your PI goes up and you go up by adding arc above L4. Uh, so now let me show you this one. So uh, Alex, are you able to, uh, I wonder if Alex has any comments or similar thoughts about the case uh, uh, in approaching something like that? Yeah, hello, Mike. Um, hello from, from Switzerland. It's impressive, beautiful results, really nice. Um, when I um, listened to Rusuli, um, then he always presented some a lot easier cases, like uh, post fusion L3 5 and then adiation level disease. So, uh, kind of stuff 
everybody sees um, uh, patient coming with adjacent uh, level um, segment disease. And he recommended uh, simply the same you did in this severe case. And it's really fantastic to see that um, it works. Um, these, um, the theory, um, because it was a French theory here in Europe uh, before it was uh, widely accepted, um, it works. And so um, I have some uh, so easy cases uh, compared to your uh, beautiful case um, with just a flat back uh, L3-5. And when it comes to adiation level disease, um, just he said, don't do just one more segment, um, go for a correction of the lumbar lordosis. And um, it is uh, really impressive um, that it works. And it's very nice. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think, you know, my, all of my thinking about this has brought me to the point where everyone, it's always a question, like when does degenerative become deformity? And I think that is, and I like, I rail against categorization of variables in our research. And I, that's the same, is that we're fusing spines, which is totally abnormal. Like orthopedic surgeons here know, like you don't fuse elbows, you don't fuse shoulders, um, unless it's like a last case scenario. We fuse spines like thousands of times a day in this country every day. And most people don't consider where they fuse it. And all of the orthopedic residents know like the, the position you fuse an elbow, the position you fuse a shoulder, but very few people I think probably know or consider where to fix L4, L5. I think if you get it right from the get go, we will reduce our reoperations. We won't eliminate, but we will reduce our reoperations for adjacent segment degeneration. And the kind of the, the, the thing that you kind of bring up also, that's a very good point is that we also have this, this push towards doing fewer three column osteotomies now. And the problem with that is that it's gonna result in more under correction, which is gonna result in lower HRQOL and more surgeries. And so when I sit at ISSG meetings and people sort of like brag about doing fewer three column osteotomies, I say, you know, once I sort of had a good, what I thought or think is a good grasp of the sagittal plane, I basically had one every week. I had a PSO every Wednesday at Wash U and a front back uh, every Thursday uh, to make that lordosis right, uh, to give us the best chance at a durable result. So then I will uh, go through this. Um, so that you guys, and this is sort of where we came from and I've seen this, thank goodness, this isn't something Mike Selby put up. I plucked this off of LinkedIn, right? Where we're talking all about how good we are, right? Look at, we planned this surgery and we did these rods and custom rods. This patient has hip flexion, pelvic retroversion. They're like plus eight. This is immediately post-op. This is not the future of spine surgery. This is a missed opportunity for a home run where we, because we don't know what we're doing. This is cannot be, this is not sustainable if this is the future, right? Um, yeah, Mike, and so the, slides moving. what's that? I don't see your slides moving. I may be, may be seeing it wrong, but I, you're still on the six pre-op six month thing. Oh, you, oh, I'm sorry. Here, let me, uh, oh, I switched it, but maybe I didn't switch you guys. Share screen. This one. Is that better? See Michael yeah. Jackson? Mike, the, the only comment I have about that last case, and, you know, I talk to you about this all the time is, you know, that patient clearly looks very well balanced, but their pelvic tilt and T1 pelvic angle is still high. When, you know, is it okay to accept these very high pelvic tilts and T1 pelvic angles in patients with such a high PI? As long 100%. As yeah, because L1, like L1 PA, T4 PA, T1 PA, they're all totally related to your pelvic incidence. Yeah. And the notion that 12 is the right number for pelvic incidence or for, um, for TPA, is, it's wrong. I like that. Uh, I'll show you. I think I have it in our slides. So this is what I was talking about. This is the one that I plucked off Instagram or whatever it is. They tagged the CEO of Medtronic, but this patient's forward. They're not even out of the hospital. Look at, this is going to PJK. This is pelvic retroversion. This is hip and knee flexion. This is not going to work. Um, and we need to do a better job. Right. And I have this in here. Are any of these acceptable? Of course not. We all know this is not acceptable. Uh, and we tend to accept this in spine surgery to some extent. We got to stop. Very quickly, right? Apes have a globally kyphotic spine and we develop in kyphosis, right? In utero and the acquired sagittal curvatures come with bipedalism. First, 
you know, do tummy time, you get some cervical, cervical lordosis, then you're crawling around, you get both cervical lordosis and lumbar lordosis, then it matures into acquired lumbar lordosis, acquired cervical lordosis with the primary curvatures of thoracic kyphosis and sacral kyphosis, as we try to stand in the cone of economy, right? In the cone of economy, this was also really like illustrative to me, is when you get their lordosis right, these patients, 10 times their vision, you get it right, they're happy because they can stand at the window and look out the window without doing any work. And understanding that they are standing without doing any work is essential because not only do you realize that it's more comfortable, but because when you stand without doing any work, there is no active pelvic retroversion because they are not forward, which means that your spinal instrumentation at the bottom is under compression. It is not under tension. And the adjacent segment disc is also under normal forces and not under compression and a ventral force that will encourage PJK. Leaving the cone of economy, right? It's a frequent indication for surgery, but there's no debate that forward alignment can be debilitating, but it is not ubiquitously debilitating because life is a kyphosing process. And this is where I sort of get into age adjusted. That you can be asymptomatic and forward like this AS patient here, or you can be fixed and forward and be miserable like the patient on the right. Schwab and the SRS group, they, it was very nice first effort, right, at this, um, at describing sagittal profiles. They, and the real thing is that they highlighted the importance of PI and the importance of the relationship between pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis. Though I would encourage everyone to look here and, you know, it's PI minus LL less than 10 which has become mutated into within 10, which means you put a, a sign over here and it's 10 to 10, right? Minus 10 to 10, which is a 20 degree range, which is totally wrong, right? It's not within 10, it's less than 10 is what Frank described. And then the problem also is they describe pelvic tilt as less than 20 as non-pathologic and over that is some form of deformity. That is only true if they are uh, engaging pelvic retroversion and don't have a super high. PI. This also illustrates the problems caused by categorizing continuous variables that I just told you about. Like, what if it's 20.1? What if it's 10.1, right? Are they actually different? Of course not. They're not different. The median isn't the message also. So we need to get away from this effort that we have towards describing things in the average. And sometimes being average is perfectly fine, but sometimes you need a personalized, individualized target. And I would say in something where pelvic incidence is variable, we also need to track target um, individualized lumbar lordosis shapes and magnitudes. I think the next really nice thing, and I think really essential to understanding standing sagittal plane alignment is the Rusli classification, which has now been uh, refounded into five types um, where the type is the shape of the spine. So don't think about the PIs yet, just so everyone understands this. And also understand, right, that Frank Schwab's criticism, and I already said, is that Frank doesn't like this because he cate recently categorizes the continuous. And once you understand that this is categorization of the continuous, it will make a little bit more sense too. So the shapes go from a large sweeping C with the apex of lordosis essentially at L5. And as the pelvic incidence goes up, the apex moves north, giving you a, a S right? The apex moves up and it becomes an S. And as the pelvic incidence goes up, the magnitudes of the lordosis and the apex go up. So that a type four, right, is lots of thoracic kyphosis, lots of lumbar lordosis with an apex around L3. This is, this is like the PI of 80 patient. This is the PI of 35 patient. All of the lordosis from L4 to the sacrum and it's a sweeping C. And this, especially for those of us that do idiopathic scoliosis surgery in children, this can really be a killer because you get instructed that T10 to L2 should be flat. It's not. In this patient, it should be kyphotic. And if you make it flat, you're going to have junctional issues, both caudal and cranial. Uh, this is what I would, everyone should look up his paper and read his papers if you have not. This is exactly what um, Camilo was talking about that um, Rusely describes how they degenerate. So a type one can degenerate into thoracic degeneration uh, where the thoracic spine kyphosis gets larger and then they compensate below with changes. 
or they can become globally kyphotic where they lose lordosis through the degenerated discs and gain kyphosis through the degenerated thoracic spine. Type twos can become a type one through thoracic degeneration. They can flatten their lumbar spine and have thoracic lordosis as a compensatory mechanism, or again, they can become globally kyphotic through failure of everything. Uh, and so then oh, well, we can talk about this too. I got to make sure we hit on this um, because I, I, I've argued sort of just passionately against this. And finally, in a meeting with them, he came up with a very cogent argument against the concept of age-adjusted realignment targets. So age-adjusted realignment targets, and I was in the room, right, when we were doing all of this work, came up from the, the idea that older people can't tolerate as big a surgery, right? They can't take as much. Maybe we shouldn't do as much. And you know what? I sometimes I do less and they do okay, was sort of the thinking. And it was proposed as a target for health-related quality of life. Uh, and you should read the paper because the paper is really screwy actually and probably should not have made it through peer review. Subsequent to that paper, then we said, well, maybe it actually decreases PJK or PJF. And so then we defined spinal pelvic alignment thresholds uh, accounting for age and spinal deformity. And now ultimately, like, does this pass face validity? Not at all. Not unless you're in a Christopher Nolan movie, right? Where like you're going back and forth uh, in time. Other than that, time moves in a linear fashion. And so how, if you operate on a 50 year old, but they're going to life expectancies to 85, how does age adjusted alignment targets work? It doesn't work obviously, right? And also age, chronological age, Chris Ames is doing great work in this arena showing us that chronological age is kind of bunk, right? And chronological age in general is a proxy for biological age. But those of us that operate on decrepit spinal deforming patients understand that we will see a 50 year old that looks like a 90 year old and you'll see a seven year old that looks like a 40 year old. And that is sort of the, um, the overall health of the patient is very, or very dependent on the other um, health factors they have going on. And now my actual argument against spinal age adjusted alignment, right? Is that for the statistics nerds out there, age and degeneration are nearly perfectly collinear, right? At Scott Bowden's paper shows us that in the lumbar spine, as your age goes up, the likelihood we find degeneration goes up. And at the age of 80, it is almost ubiquitous that you will have degeneration, right? So age and degeneration go hand in hand. Those Russell Lee slides I just told, showed you show that degeneration and deformity go hand in hand. So what we are actually measuring when we graph a bunch of people that present to a spinal deformity clinic, right? These are not asymptomatic, um, non-degenerated people. When we look at those cohorts and we say, oh, look, age-adjusted alignment targets, we are actually offering you degeneration-adjusted alignment targets, which is nonsensical, right? Completely ridiculous that we would say, okay, well, you got bad degeneration. So like, I'm going to under, under correct you. That's just completely not right. Here's a, this is a nice, the only biomechanics study as of not even real biomechanics, a finite element analysis study uh, that shows that under correction is bad for the adjacent segment. Wujin Cho published this in Spinal Deformity Journal, right? As your pelvic, re and, but it illustrates it nice because as your pelvic retroversion goes up over here on the left, think about this instrumented segment. If you're retroverting your pelvis, this thing is going this way, right? This is moving to the left, but the body is forward. So everything above it is moving forward. And that juxtaposition of moments here is what is catastrophic. Um, the Europeans subsequent to age adjusted, and I think in thinking of, and this is actually Pierre Rousselli's program, uh, I think offered a very nice next step in terms of offering personalized alignment targets, understanding one, that we got to stop analyzing HRQOL. HRQOL are important, but they are so multifactorial and so hard to predict that we need more discrete outcome measures. And so they, they recognize that alignment is related to mechanical complication, which were PJK and rod fracture, right? Pseudarthrosis. 
And while external validity of this thing has been challenged time and time again, I, I want everyone to understand that the concepts are the key. The concepts were lumbar lordosis magnitude, distribution of the lordosis, which is the shape, global sagittal plane alignment matters, right? You get the lumbar spine right, but if they got thoracic kyphosis, and they're all forward, you're still not going to do a good job. The other thing that often is missed in this study, right, is when you do your gap score, older patients over 65, you get one point right away because the older they were, the more intolerant they were of malalignment, right? And this is where age-adjusted and gap go head to head. Age-adjusted advocates for malalignment, and GAP advocates for perfect because the older are less tolerant of it. And so in our, what I wanted to do, right, was I wanted to come up with a better way to describe the normal relationship of the, like the spinal pelvic alignment and lumbar pelvic alignment in measures of sagittal balance in a cohort of asymptomatic people without degeneration. And so we have this multi-ethnic alignment normative study, 488 people from five countries. So we have a worldwide patient sample. Then we went through it and we excluded patients with any evidence of radiographic degeneration, any scoliosis, and they were all supposed to be asymptomatic, but one patient snuck in with an over, ODI over 20. And these were the angles that we focused on for the purpose, though in subsequent work that, because the French are all about the um, the skull hip axis. So Jeff and I went back and looked at the C2 tilt. And so here, right, this is a patient with 80 degrees of lordosis. This is a patient, or sorry, pelvic incidence, a patient with 30 degree pelvic incidence. And what you will see is their L1 pelvic angle, right? I described it briefly earlier, a line from uh, S, midpoint of S1 of the femoral heads and the midpoint of L1 of the femoral heads, right, which describes both magnitude and shape is 10 degrees and the PI of 80 patient. In the PI of 30 patient, it's minus six. But lo and behold, what is the point? The point is that it wants to put L1 in the same position relative to the vertical axis. The L1 tilt is minus eight. The L1 tilt is minus eight. They wanna put the spine in the same position relative to the vertical axis of the legs, which includes the, the, the normal pelvic tilt, right? T1 tilts are essentially the same. T1 pelvic angle here is 14, right? You read the paper, you'd think this person's forward even though this person's not degenerated and has an ODI under 20. T1 pelvic angle is zero for this patient. And you can see too, this, it's really about the C2 tilt, right? The C2 tilt is, is essentially the um, same as the uh, hip, uh, odontoid hip axis, uh, and it's close to zero in most people, minus two to plus two, close to zero. And just quickly, wait, what about sagittal malalignment by age or alignment by age? Now, if we exclude degeneration, what do we find? There is no relationship between spinal alignment and age. The relationship that is measured in all of those patients or papers is the relationship between deformity and degeneration. It is not age. So how do we come up with better measures for um, how to fix the spine, right? And because if you look at the papers, you look at gap and initially this started, I thought if we had a nice clean cohort, I would come up with a LL prediction model with a much higher R squared than the gap paper. The gap paper I think is about 0.28. And when we did it with this one, the R squared was 0.36 or something, which is still not okay. And as I said before here, first, the first thing we do is T1 tilt, L1 tilt, right? This is putting that thing in space relative to the vertical axis. They're the same. And they are independent of the pelvic incidence. Doesn't matter what your PI is. You want your T1 PA, L1 PA, sorry, a T1 tilt, L1 tilt, C2 tilt to be in the same place. What is related, right, is the L1 pelvic angle and the pelvic incidence. So the L1 pelvic angle by pelvic incidence, this is our regression line. It's half of the pelvic incidence minus 20. And that gives you an R squared of 0.6, which in a biological system, I think is very high. And these are, this is not 95% confidence interval. This is 80% prediction interval. This is four degrees on either side, which is actually pretty tight. That's kind of nice that you can have such a tight prediction interval around it that as long as you're within four, most likely you are gonna put that person in a normal place for the population on the whole. 
half of PI minus 20 to get your L1 PA. This is the sagittal angle Cobb's bipelvic incidence, important to see right here, L5 S1 on average, people have 25 degrees. The confidence or the, the prediction interval bars are kind of wide, but in general, 25 degrees. That's why, you know, every time I talk to industry and they say something about their hyperlordotic cages, I have to correct them and say they're not hyperlordotic, they're appropriately lordotic. And for 20 years, you guys sold us hypolordotic flat back cages. But L5 S1 lordosis is independent of pelvic incidence. L4 to S1 lordosis is independent of pelvic incidence, right? And that is what's reflected here. This dark green bar is a PI of 80. This light blue bar is a PI of 30. These patients don't diverge until they're above L4. So in general, right, as you approach your patients, L4 to the sacrum is kind of the same for everybody. And it's really the changes that come above. And what you can see here, right, this, these, the changes in the apices of these lines, right, or the, where the derivative, like the derivative is zero, right, moves north according to your pelvic incidence. So this pelvic incidence of 80 person, what did we just show in that one that I showed you, right? They don't turn around until T11. And that's what our woman, that L2 to the sacrum woman was doing post-op. She was turning around at the T10, T11 disc. So what, what good is this? Not that much new. We can confirm the, sh the relationship between the magnitude and the shape, but it does also help you. And this, I think really like, this is really informative for degenerative spondylolisthesis, a very common reason around the world for a single level fusion. And I would say probably a very common reason in all of our countries for an iatrogenic flat back is even with those expandable things, if you make it 10 degrees, 10 degrees at a single segment right there, that's it's kind of flat. We want closer to 15 to 20 degrees. And the problem is if you take 10 then, you just got to make sure that when you take them back, that you get, make it up someplace before all of a sudden you have that L3 to L5 or L4 to the sacrum flat back like we were talking about before. This picture sort of illustrates it nicely. I would say focus on the top, the concept of using the LPA and how the LPA is related to the distribution. So this is a patient with a PI of 40. PI of 40, your lumbar lordosis in general, 60% of PI plus 30. So a PI of 40 is generally... In general, my target would be 55 degrees. So if they have a low lordosis and that lordosis is up high, you can see this, this is flat from L4 to the sacrum. I would say this is a very classic, you know, four years ago, six years ago, when we'd have a flat back and then we'd say, okay, let's do an ACR, a couple ACRs. We're going to get the lordosis within, it's going to be within five degrees. It's going to be perfect. The problem is that your LPA is still high. And for this person, to normalize their L1 tilt or C2 tilt, the only way for them to do that is to do a ton of pelvic retroversion. And once they retrovert their pelvis, you're going to be off to the races, right? That's the four up arrows, tons of pelvic retroversion to get it right. What if the lumbar lordosis is all at L5-S1? This person had a flat L2 to L5, and then you do it all at L5-S1. The LPA is going to be low. The lumbar lordosis is going to be low. The only way they can compensate is a little bit of pelvic retroversion and then maximizing their thoracic hyperextension, which they can do for a little while, but then they'll get tired. So now what if we give them a, an appropriately low L1PA with an appropriate amount of lordosis, then they can stand with balance. Again, the upside down spine even though the lordosis is right, they got their huge ACR, huge ACR, the only way they can restore their L1 tilt, T1 tilt, C2 tilt to get back into this green zone is through massive amounts of pelvic retroversion, which is bad. We need to eliminate the compensatory mechanisms. So I gave this all to Lanky and he was like, Kelly, come on, you're being ridiculous. We want categories and we want simple equations. So in general, target L1PA, 50% of the pelvic incidence minus 20. The beauty of the L1PA is that you can measure it much more easily intra-op on deformed patients than trying to figure out where the ellipses are and what the cob angles are. You measure the LPA, hip, meter of the sacrum, middle of L1, you're good. While you're planning your surgery, target lordosis of 60% of PI plus 30. 
in general, if you want more low doses, you need more low doses, it's almost always got to be low so that you will keep the LPA low and we don't help the LPA climb up too high. And this is what I was talking about. This is the vertebral tilt by level, pretty narrow bars for all of the, the vertebral spinal tilts um, in asymptomatic, non-degenerated people. Uh, Virginia LaFay, like, you know, we have some differences, but at the end of the day, Femi, Virginia, and I, we all sort of are on the same page. It's just where we think it needs to take us. But Virginia has some very similar papers where she looks at risks of PJK according to the tilts. And if you get the instrumented tilts wrong, you do poorly. And one of the things here to, to recognize this, I, I'm so annoyed that this paper got rejected by JBJS, but they said, well, you know, this is good for lumbar fusion. What about the rest? And that's one of Gupta's things always like, well, what do we do with the thoracic spine? Look at the L1 tilt. And what does it correspond to? The T4 tilt. The L1 tilt and the T4 tilt are almost always, again, within four degrees of one another. So that helps you plan your thoracic kyphosis um, so that your L1 tilt and, or sorry, L1 PA and T4 PA are the same. And um, it's going to be, it, hopefully it'll get accepted at the SRS, but we went, so we took this data. This is all just hypothetical, right? This is all describing how normal people stand. And we took it to the ISSG and looked at their database. And what we found, right, we all know that, um, that PJK is multifactorial and pseudo is multifactorial. But if you do the partial effects plots where you make an equation and then you look at the contribution of LPA alignment, as you deviate from normal lumbopelvic alignment as measured by the LPA, your risks of failure go up. And then once you add on top of that, as you deviate from T4 PA, also your risk of failure goes up, but it's not nearly the same as not getting the lumbopelvic harmony right. You've got to get the lumbopelvic harmony right and eliminate the compensatory mechanisms. So I think putting this all together, right? You got to determine your upper instrumented and lower instrumented levels, and then you got to figure out segmental alignment. And, and again, I already said this, right? All spine surgeries are necessary except for the first. And a 10 degree L4, L5 segment is a setup for failure. And here's another one, right? Planned robot surgery, perfectly reduced in zero degrees of lordosis, which is not right. And that's this patient. And look, look at this hips out here. This is a high PI patient. This is now a huge, huge problem it's also not going to get fixed with an A-lift. And as Mike as astutely pointed out before, this is going to be a challenging A-lift because that symphysis is going to be around here. So you got to get it good, get it right. I like to determine your ideal Rusely shape. There is no such thing, I don't think, as looking at the Rusely shape pre-op. It is determining what you think the shape of the spine should be post-op. Determine the amount of lordosis. In general, 60% of PI plus 30 is good. And then look at the CT scan and measure L4 to S1 and L1 to S1. I use the CT scan because that's recumbent and it gives you a better idea of what you're going to get. Using the upright films to describe uh, how much you've changed people is a little bit erroneous and misleading, especially when they have vacuum discs and things like that. So if you have 40, do you have 40 degrees from L4 to S1? If no, how are you going to get it? Do you get it through any interior? Do you get it through a PSO? You're not going to do an ACR that low. If you do have it that low and you're hypolordotic, then where can you get it above? And that is perhaps a case where an ACR is appropriate or a higher L3 PSO. I think you know for most of us, L4 and L5 PSOs are in vogue. Um, maybe we'll, it's just a phase because L5s are challenging. Um, uh, but L3s generally we don't do because it doesn't give you that perfect shape and it undercorrects your LPA at a time when you're still correcting the LL. Avoid the pitfalls. I really, truly believe age adjusted is wrong. I think we're doing a disservice by going out and preaching it. Make sure your rod's kyphotic wherever you stop, unless you do an L2 UIV. Careful with your rod placement. If you talk to Bruce Lee and Gupta, they don't use tulip heads. They use posted systems. Tulip heads stink because if your rod's not perfect and it's not sitting in that tulip head and you put that reducer on or you use reduction screws, you're pulling the spine to the rod and that's causing spine to come up and it flexes your disc spaces and you lose lordosis. You do that a couple times, you can lose five to 10 degrees of lordosis pretty bad, pretty quickly. I love the articulating bed. Uh, I, you have to be very careful with pad placement so that you're able to make the correct amount of lordosis. And then really, like really, 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 you've got to avoid the false type two. 
The false type two is a high PI patient who stands with the small subtle S. Right, a small subtle S like this. High PI patient, it should have a real S, right? Type three or a type four. And the subtle, subtle S is bad because now this patient, oh, let's see, let me do this thing. Now this patient, they're usually, it's actually C7 sometimes falls behind the hip in between the sacrum and they're retroverting their pelvis. They're retroverting their pelvis. This fusion mass is going this way. Their spine's going this way. They have this juxtaposition of forces here. It's not good, not good. So uh, you guys will see your, your elbow. Um, the false type two, where's this advancing? Right, so that's what happened. This patient, PJK, had pain. They went up. What happened? They PJK spinal cord injury on the weekend. So what happened? Someone took her up and they didn't fix the lordosis. What happened? She PJK, bad spinal cord injury. Um, and here's a, a final case, right? And this is a nice one to think about. Again, making huge amounts of lordosis being correct and not wildly incorrect. This is a 65 year old who has an inability to stand upright, has thor thoracolumbar pain, and some difficulty with horizontal gaze, can't, can't maintain her head upright. Um, she's got one prior front back thoracolumbar fusions, two prior cervical fusions with C2 to T2 and L3 to S1. She walks without an assistive device, but you can see this is like a class, this is not even a classic, this is a classic upside down spine, right? But this is a subtle S with maximized pelvic retroversion. I think it's a nice picture of why using C7 is not good. And really one of the benefits of global sagittal alignment as uh, either the TPA or the, glo uh, the uh, global sagittal angle, right? Here we go. PI of 60, lumbar lordosis of 47. Again, we would say, oh, it's kind of close. Maybe she doesn't, maybe you just connect things and they're okay. SC7, SVA is zero. Again, if you're not paying attention to compensatory mechanisms below, you say, well, she's got good global alignment. You're within 13 degrees. I would just put her prone and fix her up. T1 PA is very high though. What did I do? I did an L4 pedicle subtraction osteotomy that here looks just completely ridiculous on the table again. Tulip heads are almost kissing, but this is her standing now, right? Look at where the hips are now. Hips are here. Horizontal gaze is perfect and very comfortable. And this is actually, for a lot of you, like doing this actually changed opioid use in my practice. Before that, Lenke and I did a study where we prospectively enrolled people and followed their opioid consumption for two years. And at two years after surgery, 20% of people that were not taking opioids beforehand were. And our reaction was like, oh, you had a big surgery. And we would blame the patient rather than blaming ourselves and our undercorrection. And I think if you correct people, they are definitely more comfortable and they don't have that achy low back pain from what is now essentially like you make subtle flat backs. You know, they're not off by 40 degrees, but they're off by 15 degrees, 12 degrees, 18 degrees. Um, just like I think Alex was talking about before that, like that subtle flat back, you've got to fix it. You have to fix it. Best way to fix it is to never make it in the first point. Uh, all right. My question, question for you, is that L1 pelvic angle dependent on pelvic retroversion? I mean, if they retrovert their pelvis, can they fix that? Or is that a fit? Is that an independent of retroversion like the T1 pelvic it, angle? It, it includes pelvic retroversion, right? So essentially, if you fix, as long as you believe that L1 tilt and T1 tilt is, or they're going to try to normalize it. If you fix the L1 PA, you're fixing the pelvic tilt. And the, like, in even like, I haven't found a good way to verbalize it yet, Camilo, but one of the things is that um, you don't, uh, you don't, target pelvic tilts. You just want to eliminate pelvic retroversion. Uh, and if you eliminate pelvic retroversion, you'll be okay. But I think that's a hard thing to say because pelvic retroversion for some people with very healthy, with very high PIs is okay. If you read Bruce Lee's books, he's like people with a PI of 90 can be completely asymptomatic with a pelvic retroversion of 40 or a, pel or a pelvic tilt of 40. That's, that's okay for some of them versus a Right, because pelvic tilt or PI is equal to sacral slope by plus pelvic tilt. 
And that means that if you have a low PI, your pelvic tilt can only be high, as high as your PI if your sacral slope is zero, if you're per entirely vertical sacral slope. So if you have PI at 35, your pelvic tilt can go over 35. It's geometrically impossible. But if your pelvic uh, yeah, I think like you know, I asked Eos to um because Eos did all the, the reconstructions on that mean study for us. Yeah. I, and I yeah. was like, oh, can you give me the acetabular version? And they actually like just pla like they just pasted them into like a, a computer generated pelvis. And now they don't have the read, they're broke, so they don't have the money to um give us the acetabular version uh which kind of sucks because i think for some people if you look at those graphs we have where even by pi pelvic normative data pelvic tilt has quite substantial variance i think it's probably got to do with their pelvic version i mean sorry their acetabular version because that has to do like you've never done a total hip camilo but that has to do with where people impinge the tightness of the capsule the tightness of the periacetabular ligaments uh, I think that might be where some of the variance lies. I, I guess how do you how do you distinguish between a high pelvic tilt versus a retro versus pelvic retroversion? Because like what you're implying is that they're not the same. Uh, well, they're not the same because it depends on their pelvic incidence. That's how it's measure blind. their L, like like measure their wrong. lordosis and measure their L1 PA, and if they're high, then the pelvic tilt's wrong. And then in those graphs that you showed of the, the global cone with the low PI and the high PI and where the low doses is, can you go back to that? Yeah, uh, yeah, hold on one second. I just saw, like, I'm sorry, I saw Matt Burchuk's question about if my screws are long enough. 80 millimeters. I think if you're, if you're longer than 80 millimeters in um, basically every case, you're going to be anterior to the lumbosacral flexion point and you'll be good. Uh, shorter than 80 millimeters is no good. And this, these are really no good while we're at it. Wait a minute, you guys can't see this. Um, these things are a disaster. These S2 Alar screws, right? These don't go into the ilium, these go into S2 and back out. They're a disaster. This woman ended up getting the worst um, adjacent segment disease in her pelvis. It was horrible. Her SI joints, she basically had an internal hemipelvectomy. It was horrible. Or um, dissociation. Which one do you want to see? No, that, yeah, you were just there. The, no, the other PI. one. The one with all the, the low PI, high PI. Yeah, yeah, you just, one more to the right, this one. Because here, it looks like your compensatory pelvic tilt, the way you have that drawn, for example, in that image in the top left, it looks like it, it corrects their pelvic tilt or their L1 pelvic angle. But I guess that's... No, Straight. That it's not going to, sorry, shit, where did it just go? It's not going to correct it. The, it. Because you just, I would assume that everything, like assume that we're doing spinal deformity surgery and, and it's fused. This one? Yeah. Because I, you just assume that this is fused now. Yeah. yeah as yeah. this rocks, it's all going to move as a unit. With the pelvic end. All right. So I, I guess the, my point is that unlike a C7 SVA that they can make it look okay with high pelvic tilt, the L, L1 pelvic angle and the T1 pelvic angle are going to be independent of it. So it's a better measure than, the, than just saying their SVA. Yeah, way better. Yeah. Mike, that was great. Thanks. Thanks. I think, uh, I think, I think a lot of us are going to have to replay this and then pause it and digest it and then unpause it and then pause it and digest a little more. Um, I thought the best thing uh, you talked about was just the degenerative cases. I mean, you know, you've heard me say this before. Um, I think of deformity as encompassing all of spine. And, and you know, I, I deformed the tumor patient because I didn't get it right and had to go back, as you know. Uh, and it's just been remarkable to me how, how life-changing it is for these patients when you do get it right uh, and how terrible it is when you don't get it right. And... Um, you know, I recently had a case where I, I did a simple degen case, four or five, tried to use an expandable cage, uh, and and the patient did great. She's very happy, and I hated it because it was not, you know, it just looked so flat. Uh, and what does it what does it take to get people to stop doing that? You know what I mean? I mean, I think part of it is that that, that for me, it drives me crazy that I did that to somebody because I know it's coming back at some point in that patient's life. I know they're not where they should be. Um, but I don't know. It's, you know, it's a long-term thing. I don't know. 
I don't know what it takes to change that practice for the average surgeon. Uh, it's hard. I mean, I think we got to do as much, you know, well, first of all, things like this, where you hear counter arguments and other thoughts, things like this, where some of the people on this call probably never heard of the stuff I just talked about and you got to consider it. Uh, and we have to do research. You can't just like say it and say, believe that it's true. Uh, I, I think the ISSG stuff that we're doing is for this concept is actually pretty compelling. Um, and then after that, like you got to, you got to do a real study and show that it actually does like reduces the rates. And then how do we make it globally applicable or, I mean, that's one of the, I, I have avoided industry work life to date, but if I can come up with a computer that does this and a robot that does this so that. A four or five is the same in San Diego, Idaho, Tunisia, Singapore. That's what we need, like the democratization of spine surgery and alignment. It, you should be able to get the same thing everywhere. And that will be the outcomes and the treatment of our patients will be not infinite. Infinite is a little hyperbole, but infinitely better. Well, uh, we're way past time. That's my fault. I didn't keep us on time there, but- I'm uh, sorry. Uh, that is fantastic, dude. And uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I think we will uh, uh, end it here for now. Uh, and uh, thank you for those around the world that joined us at, at very different times, it looks like. Uh, Mike, thanks again, man. Miss having you here. Yeah, yeah, I miss it. Believe me. <laughs> thanks for letting us pick your brain tonight. All right, of course. Thanks very much. It's nice to hopefully everyone go to SRS meeting in Stockholm. <laughs> see you there all right all right thanks all. Expe hey, wait if there are nurse surgeons apply for srs membership if you need a letter of recommendation send me an email me and shaffrey will do it we want you guys to be members and to participate okay thanks there's my plug yeah nice nice plug all right thanks all right, thanks mike i'll thanks talk to you later see bye you bye. quick see you.